Okay, everyone. Hello. You. Okay. Well. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, we are going to start in just a couple minutes. Uh, Bob Sternberg's uh, keynote address which will then be followed by a cocktail at the main level, okay? And before we start, we have uh, uh, two people who will say a few words, and then I'll introduce Bob Sternberg. So first I'd like to introduce to you uh, from the European uh, Union, Madame Guterres Diaz, who is in charge of creativity and innovation <coughs> who's in charge of creativity and innovation at the European Union. And so it's our pleasure for her to be here with us today and say a few words. You have to keep it close. Yeah, okay. I will, okay. I will. Well, thank you very much to you and to Professor Luger, to Professor Stenberg, to allow me to take the micro here and now. Yes, close. I would like uh, to do two things. First, on behalf of the European Commission, to express, I am work in the Directorate General for Education and Culture, and uh, I would like to express our interest in the work you are doing, and uh, we would like to get it into our cooperation policy in the field of education. And second, I thought I couldn't miss this opportunity to announce you that uh, we will uh, be having next year the European Year of Creativity and Innovation, 2009. We hope that this year will give us the opportunity to give more visibility and to do something on behalf of creativity and innovation. We would enormously appreciate your support and your cooperation, and uh, I hope I will be able to be back on your next conference and uh, present to you more in detail this year and any ideas, any proposals we, you may have, we will be extremely uh, pleased to receive them. So let me not take any more time today and thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, so thank you very much and, and uh, that'll be, we'll have to keep creativity and innovation in mind in 2009 for the European Year of Creativity and Innovation. And now I'd like to have uh, Isabel Gillet from OGREF Test, uh, which is sponsoring Bob Sternberg's talk today, to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Hello, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm very proud and happy that uh, my publishing company, Edition au Greffe France, had the opportunity to invite Professor Sternberg in Paris, and I would like to thank Stod Lubart and his team for, to propose it to me. Nevertheless, I am sure that Professor Sternberg is wondering why a French test publishing company is doing this, but you never know with the French, you know. <laughs> As a publisher, we are trying to be a link between applied researchers and practitioners. Research for itself is great, but the goal should be, or is, I hope to, uh, to help practitioners and people. Practitioners without research techniques and instruments might be in a quite difficult position. As the topic of this symposium is educating for creativity, and as Todd Lubart, Maud Besançon, and Baptiste Barbeau are developing a battery to assess the creativity potential, an idea might be to assess people's creativity, sorry for my English, during this Congress, for those who know not being creative, like me, then follow at least one year of creativity training with Professor Stenberg and assess again. It's quite selfish because my main research is uh, about cross-cultural and I think it would be a good cross-cultural research. Don't worry, because the test epoch that they are developing in France, the norms are going only until 12, but I am not sure that we, the comparison would be in our favor anyway. But let's try to do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, it's our great pleasure and honor to have Bob Sternberg uh, with us today. He came over specially 
just for the event. And uh, so we really, really uh, want to thank him so much for uh, taking that short plane ride from Boston to Paris. Uh, and um, uh, in fact, of course, I, ha I know Bob Sternberg since uh, many years, and I had the uh, marvelous opportunity to study with him over at Yale University. And now he's currently the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Tufts University. And uh, so we worked on uh, creativity and uh, developed certain ideas and so forth. And so it's always a great pleasure to see Bob uh, coming to hang out in Paris as many people who are interested in creativity, Ernest Hemingway and other uh, famous authors and artists who are American, like Calder, also came to Paris to hang out and have a coffee in a cafe. And so, uh, so we're really pleased to have him with us and uh, we'll pass it over to Bob to tell us about creativity is a decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, especially to be with Todd Lubart, who was once my student. Uh, if there are any ideas at all today you do not like, keep in mind that mostly this is his talk. <laughs> and uh, he's sitting right there. If there are any other ideas you don't like, uh, you can see right here who to blame it on. So, <laughs> uh, and I only arrived this morning, so I'm a little tired. So I'm, that's three excuses, which is enough. Now I'll start the third part of the talk. <laughs> so the title today is that creativity is a decision. And the basic idea is that Creativity is a decision. That's profound, isn't it? Uh, so let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean is that creativity is not just about great people like Darwin and Picasso and Balzac. It's about the little things we do in everyday life when we don't have a ready solution. I mean, very little things. Uh, 30 minutes ago, I needed to go to the restroom, and I asked the host who was with me, who's in this room, where it is, and he said, it's down this hall, I'll wait here. So I walked down the hall, and I couldn't find any room that had any sign on it that looked anything like restroom. There was no picture of a man, there was no salle de bain, there was nothing. And so, I was beginning to look stupid walking back and forth down the hall, so I redefined the problem. I stood there pretending to read a poster and then waited to see a room that other people kept going into and out of, preferably men. And, well, not preferably, but you know. So, and, and then I went in that room and it was a restroom. So that's the really profound level of creativity I'll be talking about. There are other examples. Creativity is always in a context. That was a French context. Um, a few weeks ago, the chair of our geology department told me about her niece, who lives in New York City, and she had a huge dog, and it died. And she realized she didn't know what to do with the corpse of a dead dog because there was no place in New York, you can't just go outside and bury it on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> so this required her to be creative, and she had this idea to bring it to the veterinarian. But how do you get it to the vet? So she took an old junky suitcase and stuffed the corpse of the door dog in the suitcase. And then she walked on the street, with the dog in the suitcase looking like she had something of value, which it once was, in the suitcase. She took the metro to the veterinarian, and she was walking up the steps 
dragging this heavy suitcase, and a man offered to help her. In New York, this is exceptional <laughs> that anyone offers to help you, truly exceptional. And the guy said, this suitcase is really heavy. What do you have in it? <laughs> and she was very creative. You don't say you have a dead dog in the suitcase. She said, I have electronic gear. Now, you don't even realize how creative that was. Because when she said that, he pushed her and ran away with the suitcase <laughs> holding the dead dog. So in that context, a creative way of getting rid of a dead dog was to say it's computer equipment. So that's the level of creativity I'll be talking about today. I'm going to just take this off. Uh, both those stories are true, unlike the rest of the talk. <laughs> so the main message is that creativity is a decision. And the work I'm going to be talking about, the ideas, the research, they're all collaborative. Uh, I've had many collaborators, Todd Lubart, Elena Grigorenko, Linda Jarvin, and other members of the Pay Center at Yale and tough. So I do want to emphasize that this is a team effort that many people have contributed to it. So I'll be talking about creativity as a decision. I'll review some research findings uh, more toward the end. And then I'll talk about applying these ideas in educational settings. So the first question is, does creativity really matter? Uh, and that's something a lot of teachers ask about. You know, like, why does this matter? I've even had teachers say to me that creativity isn't that important. And personally, for me, this has always been a challenge. When I started, I started my career 40 years ago, in 1968, as a first-year college student. I took a course in introductory psychology because I wanted to study psychology. I'd done poorly on IQ tests as a child and wanted to understand why. So I took the course, and the very first test we were given was right before Thanksgiving, which is a holiday. I, I really am profound today. Thanksgiving is a holiday where you give thanks. I'll have some other deep things to say. So the professor, being a very humane professor, handed out the papers, the test papers, in descending order. It was a 10-point scale. He started with the 10s. And so the kids who got the 10s got up. And you could see who the really smart ones were. Then he ended out the 9s, then the 8s, then the 7s. And when he got to the 7s, I figured my paper must have gotten out of order, because he's already on the 7s. And there aren't that many people left in the room. Then he did the sixes, the fives, the fours, the threes. And he gave me my paper. There are only like five people left at it. There had been 150 or 200. Now there are about five. It had a big three on it. And he stared at me and he said, you know, there's a famous Sternberg in psychology, and it's obvious there won't be another one. <laughs> so that was discouraging. <clears throat> And I decided I don't have the ability to be a psychologist. I'll switch to math. Well, that was another story. I failed that. And so I went back to psychology, because in psychology, I got a C. And whereas originally a C looked bad, after failing the math exam, it looked, C looked pretty good. Uh, then 15 years later, I was chairing the department where that guy was a professor, and 35 years later, I was president of the American Psychological Association. And I said to the guy who was president the year before, you know, it's funny that the president of APA, which is the largest organization of psychologists in the world, got a C in introductory psychology. And this guy, whose name is Phil Zimbardo, a uh, guy at Stanford, very famous social psychologist, said, well, that's funny. I got a C, too. And it made me realize that whatever it was that 
allowed us to succeed and reach the presidency of the American Psychological Association, it wasn't sitting in a classroom memorizing books and lectures. A lot of it was having creative ideas for theories, for experiments, for teaching, for administration. And you can see this at a larger level. If you look at the big three in the United States, Chrysler, General Motors, Ford versus Toyota, well, the big three are almost defunct. They used to have almost all the market in the United States. Now they have very little. CDC was a big computer corporation. IBM still is. IBM redefined their business to be a service business. CDC never left the idea of a com that they do mainframes. RCA is pretty much gone and Sony survives. Keds, the big sneaker brand, when I was a kid, is a small brand now. Nike is doing well. Eastern Airlines is gone. Companies that don't innovate, like people who don't innovate, die. You have to innovate to survive. Uh, and you can see it that when people lack creative vision, they often say things that many years later look foolish, like Thomas Watson, chair of IBM, saying, I think maybe there's a market in the world for five computers. Or there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Or the telephone has too many shortcomings to be taken seriously. Or while theoretically and technically feasible, television isn't going to make it. Uh, and, and so on. Uh, the people who decided to reject the Beatles, who did fairly well. Uh, the idea of FedEx got a C uh, in a course at Yale. Uh, and stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau right before the crash of 1929. So very smart people, and all of these people in these quotes are smart, can lack creative vision. And that lack of creative vision can be what dooms them or their companies or their careers. So in large part, the idea that Todd and I developed some years ago is that creativity is in large part a decision to defy the crowd. And that creative people, they defy the crowd. It's like a disposition for them. It's, it's just something they do. Uh, many reactions to famous ideas when they were first proposed are pretty negative. And the, it's hard to defy the crowd because there's just pressure not to. Let me give you a trivial example of why it's hard to defy the crowd. I mean, it sounds like if that's all there is to creativity, why doesn't everyone do it? So I'm going to give you an example. So when I was a teenager, the modish style in pants was to wear extremely tight pants. Very, very tight that hugged your legs, etc. And I never have liked tight pants. I've always preferred loose pants. And so I wore loose pants. Now, my preferring loose pants was before we knew that wearing tight pants is bad for your health, especially if you're a man. You know, I got two kids, but a lot of those people who wore tight pants, they don't have any, but we won't go into that. <laughs> So it's not a good idea, but at the time, that's what people did. And when I wore these loose pants, two things happened. The first is that other kids looked at me, and they said, <laughs> Sternberg's a real dork. You know, he's wearing, that one's hard to translate. It's not a nice word. Uh, he's wearing these loose pants. So other kids looked at me, said, I'm a real dork. And after a while, I began to think, maybe I am a dork. <laughs> so there are two factors that make it hard to defy the crowd. One is external pressure. People don't like it when you do that. When you do things your own way, there's external pressure to conform. And then you start putting pressure on yourself. There's internal pressure. Interestingly, I think, this weekend, a few days ago, I was at my 40th high school reunion, and I saw the same kids who thought I was a dork 
when I was a kid, you know, and I've really showed them. I mean, you know, now I'm a dean and I've done all this work on intelligence and like one of them came up to me and said, hi, dork, so some things don't change. <laughs> anyway, so I don't think it's that funny, really. But. <laughs> so an example of how it's when people are creative, there's external pre pressure not to be, is just to look at reviews of famous works of literature when they first came out. And what it turns out is that often the reviews are quite negative. So this side of paradise, a famous American novel, a review said, it seems to us, in short, that this story does not culminate in anything. The Diary of Anne Frank, the girl doesn't have a special perception or feeling which would lift that book beyond the curiosity level. Catch-22, I haven't the foggiest idea what the man is trying to say. <laughs> Lady Chatterley's lover, for your own good, do not publish this book. The spy who came in from the cold, you're welcome to let Carré, he hasn't got any future. Atlas shrugged, I regret to say the book is unsaleable and unpublishable. So you can see that Great works of literature become great, but often not right away. The same is true in art. Edvard Munch, when he, who's considered by many the most famous Norwegian painter, when he first opened an exhibit in Munich, Germany, the exhibit closed the same day it opened. Uh, Roy Lichtenstein, whose art I love, comic book art, when it first came out, it was very negatively reviewed. Today, none of us can afford to buy it. Uh, many great scientists like Copernicus and Galileo, when their work was, first came out, they were branded heretics or loonies or whatever. Uh, even in ski jumping, uh, a Norwegian told me about uh, the standard form of a ski jump being to go like this. And in one contest, a guy went like that. And when he went like that, uh, he jumped farther than any of his competitors, but he nevertheless lost. And the reason he lost was because he was marked down for aesthetics. Because whereas that, this looks good on me, on him, it didn't look so good. <laughs> but then other ski jumpers realized he was jumping further, and they started to do the same thing. So the essence of creative work then is you need to formulate a vision of where you want things to go, to figure out how people can be pulled toward it, how they can get them there, and then to pull them. So what I will do is for maybe the next um, 20, 15, 20 minutes, I'll talk about a little bit more about some of these ideas about creativity, and then I'll talk to you about how we're applying them. So the idea is that creative people buy low and sell high in the world of ideas. That's Todd Lubert and my investment theory. Uh, creative people are value investors in the realm of ideas. They buy low and sell high, but people don't want to do that. And there are lots of ways of seeing that. Right now, at this moment, you, uh, we're trying to sell a house in Norfolk, Connecticut. It's a really beautiful house, but it's really far from Boston, and we don't get there that much. And I mean, it's really crass to use a talk like this for a real estate deal, but if any of you are interested in the house, I will be passing out brochures <laughs> after the talk. In any case, uh, we haven't had any bids. And if you're trying to sell a house in the United States now, it's almost impossible. Nothing's moving, or almost nothing. Now, that's odd. And the reason it's odd is because housing prices now are really quite low. They haven't been this low in many years. So when the mar people know you should buy low and sell high, but they don't. When the, mar when the market was high, people were buying first houses, second houses, investment houses. So it's hard to be creative because people, although they know you should buy low and sell high, they don't. Oh, I seem to have gone to the end. Well, <laughs> that may have been prophetic. That uh, any question? Now yeah, let's see if I can. What did I get back? How did I do that? Oh dear. I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, were there any questions on anything? 
Okay, because speed is really important to intelligence. And All right, so now take a piece of paper and you will be tested on the... <laughs> all right. You know, I don't know, it was Todd who made me do that. I, I don't want to give you. So, what are some examples of the kinds of creative decision making I'm talking about? Well, I'm going to just give a few. Uh, one example is that creative people have the attitude of redefining problems, of taking a problem, and if you can't solve it, you ask, is there some other way to define the problem? And the example I like, to use, I, I gave you the example of how I redefined looking for a bathroom. I looked for a room that men and women came out of when I couldn't find anything that said bathroom. Well, the example I like to give of this is an automobile executive who worked in a big automobile company in Detroit, and he had a great job, and he loved the job, and he loved the money he was making in the job, but he hated his boss. And after some years of working for a boss he couldn't stand, he decided he needs a new job. He couldn't take it anymore. So he went to see a headhunter. And the headhunter said, no problem, I'll get you a new boss. I'm sorry, I'll get you a new job. So the guy went back to his wife and he said, the headhunter said I can, you know, he can get me a new job, no problem. And the wife was teaching a course on intelligence uh, applied at a university in Michigan. And as they talked, they realized that he could redefine his problem. So he went back to the headhunter and gave the headhunter his boss's name. And a couple months later, the boss got a phone call offering him a job. And the boss took the job. And then the guy got his boss's job. So he redefined the problem of having a bad boss, not by getting himself a new job, but by getting his boss a new job. So an example of redefining a problem. Um, as I, a second, I know I skipped a slide. It's, it, even I don't think it's an important slide, so you probably wouldn't. A second example is that you have to ask, if you have a solution, is it a good solution? You know, like, if you have a solution to a problem, is this really going to work? Is it, is it, you know, is it a feasible solution? A, a third is, a creative attitude is that creative ideas don't sell themselves. You have to sell them. So this is something I've found throughout my career. Later, I'm going to be talking about the work we've done at Tufts. Everything we've done at Tufts has been a sales job. You know, it's like talking to this group, talking to that group, talking to the other group. So you'd hope by the age of, I know I look younger, but I'm 58. Anyway, uh, so uh, you would think that by then people would listen, but everything is actually, you have to, if you have an idea, you got to sell it. When I started my career, the second colloquium I was invited to give, the second talk, was at a big testing company. I thought, this is really, there goes the talk. <laughs> That's okay. Um, we sort of lost the PowerPoint, but... I, I always thought it's a good idea when you have job candidates to make sure they lose the PowerPoint. And if they can't go on with the talk without the PowerPoint, don't hire them. But obviously, they're not looking to hire me because I got the PowerPoint back. Uh, in any case, so it was my second colloquium, I was 25, and I thought, well, this is great. You know, this big testing company, which is going to go unnamed is already asking me to talk about my work on intelligence. So I took a train to Princeton, New Jersey, where the testing company was. And I gave my talk, and they hated it. They just hated the talk. And I was really depressed, because I went from thinking that I was going to change the world at 25 to I wonder if I'm going to have a job when I go back to New Haven. And then I realized, did I really expect that people are, you know, someone who's like 65 who is going to come up to me and say, you know, I sure wasted 40 years of my life doing this traditional testing stuff. It's really great that you at the age of 25 came here and told me how I should have run my career. 
So it just doesn't happen. Like if you have a creative idea, the people in the power structure aren't gonna say, oh man, I wasted my life. Thank God you came along. Uh, quite the contrary, what's most likely to happen is that they're going to be oppositional to what you do. You have to sell the ideas. Now I'm on the next slide. I don't know what to do. Uh, I'm gonna sing the national anthem of France. No, okay. So, uh, so another example of one of these attitudes is that we, in schools, we convey knowledge. And our attitude is that, you know, it's important for kids to know things because if you don't know anything, you can't, you know, you can't do anything in your life. But what people who study creativity realize is that knowledge can hinder as well as help creativity. Uh, let me explain what I mean. One example is uh, Peter French, who's now a professor at Humboldt University in Germany, but he's also organizer of the, Interna of the War International Congress of Psychology in Berlin uh, in July. But once he was a graduate student with me, and we did a study of bridge players. And what we found is that if you have people play bridge against a computer, and you make a small change in the structure of the game, both experts and novices are hurt, but they're not hurt very much. It doesn't really disrupt them. So if you change the names of the suits from clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades, to another name, Glebes, Fricks, you know, makeup names, the experts and the novices are both hurt a little, but they recover. But in another condition, we made a very fundamental change in the way you play bridge, and that is the person who put down the low card in a round led the next round. So instead of it being the high card, it's the low card. That's a fundamental strategic change in the way bridge is played. And when we fundamentally changed the way the game was played, the experts were hurt more than the novices. In other words, the cost of expertise is you becoming entrenched. As a dean, I see this every day. And that is the challenge of being in a field for a long time. I've been in psychology since my PhD in 75, is that you're, in a way, at a disadvantage because you learn to do things a certain way, and then the field starts to change, and the question is whether you can keep up with the field. Do you understand what I mean? When I was younger, I was invited to a country to give a talk, and the organizer brought me to a zoo in the uh, city where the university was. And uh, when we got to the zoo, we passed the page, cages of the primates, and the primates were engaged in what euphemistically could be called strange and unnatural sexual behavior. They were doing sexual things. I know this is France, so I could describe them in more detail, but I've repressed it. Anyway, so the guy was with, being from a different culture, stared at the primates doing these sexual things. And I, being from the prestige, in the United States, I'm from a very prestigious state called New Jersey. It's a cultured and refined state. Uh, just take my word for it. I mean, if you meet from someone, someone from New Jersey, it's culture. And so I averted my eyes because it seemed like the right thing to do. And then after he had stared at them doing the sexual stuff for about five minutes, he started to characterize their sexual behavior in terms of his theory of intelligence. And I thought this was strange. Uh, because there are very few things I know for sure, but one of them would seem to be that whatever it is that motivates sexual behavior, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with like intelligence. We had a president named Bill Clinton, and Clinton is one of our smartest presidents in terms of just like sheer IQ, but it wouldn't have predicted his sexual uh, romps. So, there, and I, I wonder, how could this world-famous psychologist think that his theory of intelligence would 
to encompass the sexual behavior of primates. And I realized that he, the cost of expertise is entrenchment. He got so used to seeing things in a certain way, he had trouble seeing them any other way. It's not just about him. It's not like you know, there are these losers out there who become old and stupid. It's really about everybody. Uh, you know, I proposed the triarchic theory of intelligence that had three parts. Then I proposed the, a three-part theory of creativity, which significantly had three parts. Uh, then I proposed the triangular theory of love, which happened to have three parts. And so now I had three theories with three parts, and people ask, well, why do all your theories have three parts? And I thought about it deeply, and I realized that I had three reasons why they had three parts. <laughs> and at that point, I knew I was in trouble. So I was getting stuck. And now things are different. Now I call my theory WIX, Wisdom, Intelligence, and Creativity. But the S stands for synthesized. So it has four parts, sort of. OK, so the point then is that Knowledge can help our creativity. I'm going to give one more example of these attitudes, and then I'm going to move on to some other things. So you have to be willing to take risks. The creative people, or maybe I'll do two of these, or, or have to be willing to take risks. When I was coming up for tenure at Yale, uh, I started hearing that I was going to have to, that some of the reviews weren't so good, and the reason they weren't so good, I heard was because I was studying intelligence. And intelligence is considered a junky part of the field of psychology, I was told. So these outside referees were saying, why give tenure to a guy who studies intelligence when you could give it to someone who studies important things, like thinking or reasoning or problem solving? So I went to see a mentor, and I said to the mentor, Wendell Garner, you know, I think I made a mistake defining my work as intelligence. I could have done the same work, but I could have called it thinking or reasoning or problem solving. And now what should I do? Because I hear it's going to cost me my job. And he said, you want my advice? I'll give you my advice. My advice is you should do exactly the same thing you've been doing. When you came here, your mission was to try to transform the field of intelligence. And now you're afraid it may cost you your job. And you're right, it may cost you your job. But your whole purpose of being a professor is to change the field of intelligence. That's what you have to do. Years later, when I was 55, three years ago, I went to Tufts. And I'll tell you in a few minutes about the Kaleidoscope Project, which was a way of changing the way students were admitted to Tufts. And I knew if the project was failed, I might lose my job. Deans don't have tenure. But I took the risk, and as I think you'll see, the results are pretty good. So risk taking isn't just something about being 15 or 25 or 55. It's a part of creativity at every point in your life. And I, the last thing I'll mention is that to be creative, you need to be willing to overcome obstacles. And by that I mean, when I, I mentioned the loose pants, if you're creative, people are going to think you're nuts. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Much of the time, they'll say to you, you know, it's just not the way things are done here. I mentioned I was just at my high school reunion, which was kind of interesting, a 40th reunion. It was interesting because of one of the people I saw there. Uh, when I was 13, and I first met this woman who I saw at my reunion uh, a few days ago, uh, I, I had done poorly on IQ tests, and I wanted to figure out why, so I did a project on mental tests. And I had this idea of creating my own intelligence test, the Sternberg test of mental abilities, which you've probably heard of. It's widely used throughout the world. Uh, if you don't want to buy the house, I would suggest you buy the test, if I can still find it. In any case, 
Uh, I also went to the library in my town and I found the Stanford Binet IQ test in the adult section. And uh, the, Todd Lubart and others just organized the Binet conference last year. So here was the IQ test. And I thought it would be good practice to give it to some of my friends. So this girl who I just saw at the reunion, she's now 58 too, but she was a girl then. Uh, at the time, I was romantically interested in her. And I had this really great idea. You remember I said I did poorly on IQ tests. but. Social and practical intelligence are largely independent of academic intelligence. And as a dean, one of the things obviously I have to be good at is social and practical intelligence. So I had this really brilliant idea that I could break the ice with her, get her interested in me by giving her the IQ test. <laughs> so I gave her the test, and she did very well. Uh, but Astonishingly, it did not spark a romantic interest. <laughs> I then gave it to a guy I'd known from Cub Scouts who significantly did not come to the reunion. And it turned out this guy was a, what we call in DSM-4 a, a tattletale. Uh, he told his mother that I had given him the test, and then the mother told the junior high school guidance counselor, and the junior high school guidance counselor told the school system head psychologist. And the guy came into my school and called me out of class and yelled at me for 40 minutes about giving this IQ test, ending with, if I ever brought it into school again, he personally would burn it. So that's what I mean by overcoming obstacles. I mean, that was definitely an obstacle. But what I came to realize is that, you know, throughout my life, I've asked, you know, what happens? Why is it that so few people are creative? When I was a, I was a graduate student, and I got my PhD in 1975 at Stanford. And it, in 75, Stanford was arguably the best or one of the best psychology departments. And we're all wondering, how do you become famous like our advisors? And over the years, I looked at the students who, I, who were in my class at Stanford and in surrounding classes, and most of them disappeared from the field. And I came to realize it wasn't because they weren't smart. It wasn't even because they couldn't be creative. It's because they gave up. Too many grant proposals rejected. Too many articles rejected. Too many talks where people didn't like the talk. Just too many obstacles. And after a while, they said, it's not worth it. I'm not even paid that well in this field. So a lot of creativity, then, is about overcoming obstacles. What I, but you get the, the point I'm trying to make is that to a large extent, creativity isn't an attitude toward life. It's not just about an ability you're born with. These are all things anyone can do. And there are others. Uh, I won't have time to talk about them. Finding what you love to do, continuing to grow, not getting stuck, believing in yourself, tolerating ambiguity, and having a sense of humor about yourself. That, you know, you, have to, you, you learn from your own mistakes. When I was younger, I gave a talk at Pittsburgh. And even I thought the talk stank. And then there, in the middle of the talk, there was a fire alarm. And everyone left for the fire alarm. And then after the fire alarm, they, talk, they said, come back after the fire alarm to hear the rest of the talk. Well, about you know, three or four people came back. And you know, I could have thought, oh, this is horrible. They hate my talk. But I learned. I, I never gave that talk again. <laughs> Don't laugh. You're hearing it today. Anyway, so uh, seeking an environment that rewards creativity. So what I want to talk about now is what have we done with all this stuff? If you believe that creativity is really important, my first point, and that it's largely a matter of attitude, and it's about defying the crowd, what can you do with that? So for a long time, uh, I worked with great students like Todd and Elena Grigorenko and many others, and we studied creativity, and we published articles. And to some extent, I, I still do that. But 
when I, I reached a point when I was in early, my early 50s where I started to ask myself, how can you actually do anything with this? So we did studies in schools. And for example, we do studies where we teach for creativity and we'd show that, hey, you know, we can improve kids' creative performance. We can actually improve their grades. But then the grant would end. And that was the end of that. So I'd like to say something about where I've gone with this in the last few years. So, and it, it kind of started with a project we did at Yale. It was called the Rainbow Project. And it was in my last years at Yale. And it, it involved about 1,000 students from all across the United States, uh, 15 different high schools and universities. And the idea was, it, it was funded by the College Board, which is the organization that creates the SAT, which is the big college admissions test in the United States. And we were going to see whether tests of creative thinking, if used for university admissions, would have a positive effect on a number of things. So we created creative as well as practical tests. So a creative test, some of them were telling stories. Like you'd get some titles for stories. You know, and they're the kinds of things that came out of research with Todd and others. So, you know, a title might be 6,321 or uh, starting with the end or the light bulb broke. And you'd get strange titles and then you could tell a couple stories, you'd write a couple stories based on these titles. In another activity, you would show a collage, a pictorial collage of like a bunch of athletes or a bunch of musicians and you would orally tell a story. Or in another activity, you would get a cartoon and you'd have to caption it. And there were also some practical activities and some analytical activities. So we gave these tests of creative and practical thinking to about, and analytical thinking, to about 1,000 students. And what did we find? So our first finding was we did what's called a factor analysis to tell us the underlying structure of the test. And we got one, and this is published, it was published in 2006, so if you're interested, I can send the paper. First finding was we got three factors a creative factor, that was good. A practical factor, that was good. But the third factor wasn't analytical, the way it was supposed to be. It was paper and pencil tests. Multiple choice, paper and pencil tests. And so what it suggested is that methods are really important. If you test using multiple choice, that in itself is very powerful. There's a method factor. And it suggested to us that it's really hard to test creativity and practical thinking using multiple choice. A second question we asked is for people to be interested in this test, it needs to improve prediction of college performance. You know, Because they already have in the United States the SAT, they have high school grades, they have teacher recommendations. So we use something called hierarchical regression to ask how much better do we predict university performance if we use our tests of creative and practical thinking. And we found we doubled prediction of academic success, doubled it. So the, and the more important tests were the creative ones. So using creative thinking tests significantly and substantially improved prediction of college performance. The third question we asked was, what happens to ethnic group differences if we test for creative as well as practical thinking? Now, you may ask, well, why should it make any difference at all in terms of ethnic or cultural groups? And the answer is the following. Uh, much of the work we've done over the years is on cultural differences in conceptions of intelligence. So for example, we found that in different cultures, people conceive of intelligence in different ways. So uh, in the United States, we got three factors. Uh, one was sort of 
verbal ability, one was practical problem solving, and one was social competence. In Taiwan, we found one was cognitive ability, one was interpersonal competence, your ability with other people, another with intrapersonal competence, understanding yourself, another was knowing when to show you're smart, like when you give a talk, and another was knowing when not to show you're smart. Like if you go out on a date with a man or a woman and you start you know, discussing your ideas about physics, that may not be the time to do that. Or if you go, you know, if I, tonight uh, there's a dinner, if I go to the dinner or the party after this and I say, I didn't finish my talk, stop drinking folks, I have to finish my talk. That's not a good time to show your intelligence. Uh, in Kenya, we got four different words for intelligence, Luro, Winjo, Paro, and Rieko, and only one of those words, Rieko, had anything to do with academic intelligence. So different cultures have different ideas about what it means to be smart. Moreover, the tasks that matter to being smart differ from one place to another. So for example, we did work with Eskimo kids in Alaska. And these Eskimo kids can go from one village to another village in the frozen tundra in the winter, and they can go 100 miles in a dog sled and get there. If you were to give the same task to their teachers, the teachers would die. They wouldn't know how to get from one village to another when there are no visible landmarks. Yet the teachers think the kids are stupid. So the kids have hunting, fishing, navigation abilities that are really important in their context, but the teachers don't value those abilities. We did work in rural Kenya where we showed a negative correlation between kids' knowledge of natural herbal medicines used to fight parasitic illnesses and IQ. So the point is that different cultures value different kinds of skills, and so they develop kids in different ways. By broadening the kinds of skills we measured in the Rainbow Project, we enabled kids to show skills they otherwise wouldn't show. For example, on our Rainbow Test, American Indian children had the lowest scores on the analytical section. Well, that's the same thing that everyone else finds. But on oral storytelling, which is more part of their culture, they had the highest scores. So what we found is that the rainbow tests substantially decreased ethnic group differences at the same time that they increased prediction of university performance. And that's a hard result to get. Usually, when you decrease ethnic group differences, you decrease performance. So these are really good results, we think, and you should too. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you and you're a bad person. <laughs> so we presented these results to our funding agency, the college board, and you know, we thought, this is really great. You know, we have these wonderful results. They've only been given us, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. Now they're going to give us the big bucks. And they did change our funding. They cut it off entirely. <laughs> so this was not what we had been hoping for. And there could be different interpretations of why the organization that creates the SAT would cut off our funding. Uh, theirs was, they said, it wasn't practical. So I was reaching a point in my career where you know, I felt like I'd, I had published so many articles, even I wasn't reading them anymore. And is there some way I could, you know, I'm, if I don't leave Yale, I'm never going to be able to see whether this stuff works. So I took the deanship at Tufts, partly because it would be a way of testing these ideas, I hoped, on a university-wide basis. And I said when I took the deanship, look, what I'd like to do is read, think about why are we, why do kids go to school? You know, why do we, why kids go to university? 
I said, the reason is that you want to get, you want to educate people who will make a positive and meaningful difference to the world. And that means that they're good students, but they're also creative, and they're also wise. And so I said, what I'd like to do as dean is actually put this into practice. Take the kids who come to Tufts and use these ideas in a university. So we started Project Kaleidoscope, which is the first piece. And Kaleidoscope was a redefinition of rainbow. So on, we, we have about 15,500 applicants each year for the undergraduate school. And we put on a special section of the application some questions that evaluate creative as well as analytical, practical, and wise thinking. So some examples of creative what it might be, uh, suppose that the Germans under Hitler had won World War II, or take any historical event and suppose it had come out a different way. What might the world be like today? Or another question was, here's some titles for stories like The End of MTV, or Confessions of a Middle School Bully, or The Mysterious Laboratory, or The Professor Disappeared. Take one of the, boy, that, in a few cases that wouldn't be so bad. Uh, take one, of, or you know it would be really good, the speaker disappeared and the guy goes out. So, uh, no such luck. So write a creative essay using one of those titles. Or another example was take a piece of paper, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and draw a new product or an advertisement for a new product. So the idea was to put onto the application for the university questions that would measure creative thinking as well as practical and wise thinking. So an example of a wisdom question was take some interest you have in high school that you have not been fully able to express and say how later in your life you could use that interest for a common good. So that's an example of a wisdom question, but I'm focusing on creativity today. So as a practical matter, we made this essay optional. And the reason we made it optional is that what if this all doesn't work? This is, not, this is not just research. It is research, but it's also the real application process. And if the number of applications plummets, you know, I'd be here at this conference looking for a job. <laughs> so what happened? Well, the first thing that happened is that the number of applications actually went up, which was good. A second thing that happened, some people were afraid that if you do this, you risk conventional standardized test scores going down. And that'll hurt the reputation of the university and their published ratings. And then Dean Sternberg will be remembered as the guy who started admitting stupid classes to Tufts. But